Hi, my name is Wynne Norton. I'm a program director with the Implementation Science Team in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. Today I'd like to talk with you about theories, frameworks, and models that are used in implementation science. A brief note about disclosures. I have no financial relationships to disclose, and the opinions presented herein are mine and not official positions of the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, or the U.S. federal government. Just a brief overview about today's lecture. Number one, we'll talk about what theories, models, and frameworks are. Then we'll move on to why theories, models, and frameworks are important particularly in implementation science and how and why they should be used in research. Go over some common theories, models, and frameworks in implementation science, and then briefly go over a couple of resources to supplement some of the readings to which you've been assigned for this lecture. So to begin, what are theories, frameworks, and models? There are a lot of different definitions and conceptualizations depending on what scientific discipline you've been trained in, but generally speaking, these are some of the definitions and characteristics of theories, models, and frameworks. A theory is essentially a set of principles that are designed to structure observation, understanding, and our explanation of the world. They try to operationalize relationships between variables and predictions for how those variables interact and how they impact a particular outcome or set of outcomes. Theories tend to be more explanatory, they tend to be more descriptive, and they're relatively generalizable across different settings, populations, or particular behaviors. Models are more narrow set of variables and predictions than theory. They're more descriptive than explanatory, and they tend to be less generalizable to other phenomenon, other behaviors, outcomes, or particular populations or settings. And finally, frameworks are really an overarching structure, an outline, or a visual depiction of how concepts or variables are interrelated and assumed to influence a particular outcome or phenomenon. They tend to be more descriptive than explanatory. So why are theories, models, and frameworks important? What is their purpose in particular with respect to research? Well, they can be helpful for several different factors. First, to help identify factors that influence or may possibly influence, hypothesize to influence, processes or outcomes. They provide a guidance for conceptualizing a particular problem or process or particular behaviors. And they help one understand factors related to the phenomenon as the first step toward changing processes and outcomes. So how can theories, models, and frameworks be used in research? Specifically, they're helpful for informing or generating hypotheses for research projects, to understand processes and behavior, as an organizing framework for identifying potential barriers and facilitators, specifically with respect to implementation science. They help with a priori identification of particular implementation strategies that may facilitate the implementation process, and they can help guide the selection of appropriate measures and outcomes to use in one study. This is a nice quote by Kurt Lewin from 1951, there is nothing so practical as a good theory. And this would be applied to frameworks and models within the implementation science setting, but essentially it's helpful for organizing and informing one's research and hypotheses and theories, frameworks, or models, whichever one or several that you choose that is most appropriate to your research study, should be woven throughout the particular research project from informing your hypotheses through the process, through selection of measures and outcomes. So with respect to implementation science in particular, there was a review conducted by Rachel Tabak and colleagues in 2012 that identified over 60 different theories, models, and frameworks that were used in the published literature in implementation science. However, many of these are borrowed from other scientific disciplines, and only some are uniquely developed for implementation science. 
Having over 60 different theories, models, and frameworks can be quite daunting and a little intimidating when you're trying to select a theory, model, or framework, or several, to use in your research program. A nice way of conceptualizing these theories, models, and frameworks was presented by Nilsen and colleagues in 2015 who tried to categorize these different theories, models, and frameworks into five separate categories, which may be helpful when selecting one for your proposed study. First category for theories, models, and frameworks is process models. And these are specific steps in the process of translating research into practice. They tend to be broader and tend to encompass the entire cyclical process from identifying the problem through conducting research, through collaborating with partners, and revising one's hypotheses as needed. Determinant frameworks, the second category, are those frameworks that are useful for understanding or explaining influences on implementation outcomes, particular outcomes that are of the interest of research studies in implementation science in addition to patient or individual level outcomes of behavior change or health outcomes. The third category are classic theories. And again, many of these different theories have been applied to implementation science, but they are pulled from other scientific disciplines, such as psychology, economics, sociology, anthropology, and others. And these are theories, again, that can help and be applied to particular aspects of the implementation process or selection of particular outcomes of study. The fourth category are implementation theories. And these are theories that have been developed specifically by implementation researchers in the area based on their own research, as well as informed by other theories or classic theories from other scientific dif disciplines. And the purpose is to really understand or explain implementation processes, that is how implementation unfolds over a continuum, and how and why particular outcomes are of interest in implementation. And finally, evaluation frameworks. And these are specific aspects of implementation that could be evaluated to determine implementation success. Now, walk through a couple of examples here of the different types of five categories of theories, models, and frameworks. And these are some of the more common theories, models, and frameworks that are used in implementation science. The first here is presented by Graham and colleagues in 2006. It's a process model, and it's quite commonly used in Canada. It's the KTA, or Knowledge to Action Model. And essentially, it works through the entire cycle from identifying a particular problem to adapting that information or knowledge to the context, moving toward monitoring the use of that knowledge in a particular setting or among a particular population, evaluating those outcomes, and sustaining the knowledge use. And this knowledge to action cycle is really talking about research programs and how to move throughout that cycle as you see here. And it's talking more specifically about knowledge, and that can be a variety of different aspects. Knowledge that folks may have, an innovation or intervention, some particular concept or information that they are being asked to consider and adapt and use in their particular setting or among a particular population. An example of a determinant framework is the CIFR the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. And this was first proposed by Jam Schroeder and colleagues in 2009. And this is the original depiction here. Um, CIFR is the most widely used determinant framework in implementation research. It includes 39 constructs in five domains that are hypothesized to explain and predict implementation outcomes. There's an excellent resource if you're interested in using CIFR or exploring more about it that we will provide in the resources section. The interactive website allows you to identify constructs that may be of interest to your study, suggestions for how to measure those constructs, and even some facilitator guides for collecting qualitative data around the implementation process 
that fit within the CIFR constructs. Domain one on the left-hand side is the intervention characteristics. And these are aspects of the intervention that may facilitate or impede the implementation process and lead to implementation outcomes. Some of these characteristics include complexity or cost, and many overlap with the original five characteristics of innovation that facilitate or impede implementation proposed by Ev Rogers in the Diffusion of Innovations. The second domain at the top in the center is the outer setting, and these are factors, again, that can facilitate or impede the implementation process and outcomes, such as external policies, financial incentives, aspects that are relatively difficult to manipulate, but certainly can and should be measured to the extent possible within the context of one's research study. Domain three is inner setting in the middle below outer setting. And this domain talks about and conceptualizes constructs related to the organization in which a particular practice or program or guideline is being delivered. Examples include the organizational culture, organizational climate, implementation climate, and organizational readiness to change. The fourth domain discusses characteristics of individuals. And these are individuals who are being asked to or charged with implementing an evidence-based practice program guideline or innovation. Characteristics that may facilitate or impede implementation that are relevant to individuals or implementers include their attitudes, their self-efficacy, and their knowledge or information about a practice or program. And finally, domain five is process. Process includes a staged approach by which implementation may occur. And there are four different phases here outlined by CIFR, planning, engaging, executing, and reflecting or evaluating. Many of the theories, models, and frameworks that are used in implementation science also have different phases or processes involved to describe how implementation unfolds. The third example here is one of a classic theory. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the diffusion of innovations from Everett Rogers and his classic work on trying to better understand how diffusion of information or a particular innovation occurs. He proposed different stages in the adoption process, similar to those in CIFR and a couple of others, starting from knowledge, persuasion, decision, implementation, and confirmation. And there are a couple different elements that are considered key in the diffusion process. And these elements can act as facilitators or barriers throughout the implementation process, including characteristics of the innovation, characteristics of the adopters, particular communication channels through which the innovation is marketed or communicated, the time by which it takes to diffuse an innovation, and the social system surrounding that innovation and how that may facilitate or impede the process. Diffusion of innovations is one of the more classic theories, models, and frameworks, and it has been used across a variety of different disciplines to understand, for example, marketing, to understand different organizational behaviors, and originally it was used to better understand how different corn seeds were used in the Midwest by farmers. This is an example of an implementation theory, again, a theory that was developed by implementation researchers, in this case, Brian Weiner in 2009, that's been informed by other scientific disciplines, in this case, organizational behavior and organizational management. And this is just a depiction of the particular model that he proposes, organizational readiness for change. You see it has different constructs and hypothesized some constructs to affect others, which eventually leads to implementation effectiveness. Organizational theories are quite common in implementation science, and they're used to explain 
some of those characteristics of the organization, such as a delivery setting, a clinic, a hospital, a community-based organization, that can affect and facilitate or rather impede implementation processes and implementation outcomes. Finally, there are evaluation frameworks. And one of the most common evaluation frameworks that's used and applied to implementation research is REAIM, developed by Glasgow and colleagues in 1999. REAIM stands for Reach, Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. And these are some of the questions that can be used when planning for a dissemination and implementation project, as well as for evaluating whether or not that project practice or program was disseminated and implemented. There are a lot of different resources to assist one in using REAIM framework, and we'll provide those in the resources section. Like CFER, there's a particular website which has suggested outcomes that can be measured, suggested questions that one should ask in one's research study, and a lot of examples and helpful webinars to help one better understand how and why REAIM can be used in a research study. Here are just a couple of additional examples of series models and frameworks that have been used in implementation science. This is the EPIS, or EPIS model, developed by Greg Ahrens and colleagues. It stands for Exploration, Adoption, Active Implementation, and Sustainment. And again, this is an example of a model that is a phased approach. And you can see not only how the phases change over time as the innovation or evidence-based practice is integrated into the particular delivery setting, but also how those different variables such as outer context and inner context are similar across different processes and are also different across different processes. So you can see how some of these constructs within inner context or outer context may change over time or be more or less important in facilitating implementation through that particular process or stage. One of the more common frameworks that's used and heavily cited is an evaluation framework proposed by Proctor and colleagues in 2009. And this is really a nice framework um, and conceptual model for depicting the process of implementation from starting point of an evidence-based practice program guideline or innovation through how it is hypothesized to affect client outcomes. And the process here is that the intervention needs to be leveraged by implementation strategies, and these are some of the strategies listed here. Later on in the course, there will be another webinar on implementation strategies specifically. So these are just some of the ones that are mentioned here, which will be elaborated on in the future. And the implementation strategies are hypothesized to affect implementation outcomes, which in turn are hypothesized to affect service outcomes, and finally hypothesized to affect client outcomes. So how does one go about selecting a theory model or framework for one's proposed research study? Well, just like study design selection, the overall objective of the research study should be the primary driving factor in one's selection of one or more of the 60 or more models that have been used in implementation research. So is your research study trying to describe a process? Is it testing strategies or is it evaluating the process? And as the example suggested and more detail provided in the Nielsen article that has been assigned for reading, there are different types of theories, models, or frameworks that are better suited or best suited to help answer those particular questions that may differ by your research study. The models, theories, and frameworks, or combination of them, should be used to inform, again, your entire research study woven in through hypotheses, study design, measures, and outcomes. And in grant applications, reviewers generally like to see how and why that particular theory or selection of theories, models, and frameworks is used to help inform the entire research process through those different hypotheses, study design, measures, and outcomes. 
in NIH grant applications based on some systematic reviews and portfolio analyses, the CIFR Consolidated Framework of Implementation Research, Ev Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations, and Russ Glasgow's REAIM are the most commonly referenced in NIH grant applications. And typically, one or more of theories, models, and frameworks are included within a grant application, again, depending on if the objective is two or threefold if you're trying to describe or evaluate and or test strategies or implementation processes. So moving on here to reviewing particular guidance and resources for helping to select a theory framework, a model, or several for your particular research study. This is an interactive website that was developed um, through NCI funds to help researchers understand the different theories, models, and frameworks and actually apply to them to their research study. So the first section here is really looking at how to search through different theories, models, and frameworks. And this website is based on the Tabak and colleagues review of the 60 plus different theories, models, and frameworks. And you can look through all of them that are listed or you can search for particular ones. So if you select all of the dissemination and implementation models and their characteristics, you'll see a list of 60 or more. The model name, the D and or I, so in the Tabak et al. paper, they categorized the theory model and framework as focusing equally on dissemination and implementation, focusing more or less on dissemination or implementation, or focusing on implementation only or dissemination only. You can see the ratings for the construct flexibility, and then a note around how many different levels the theory model or framework is proposing to affect, individual, organizational, community, system, and policy. And very few frameworks or models or theories will address all of these five levels of the socio-ecological model. And again, selecting a model, theory, or framework really depends on what your research objectives are and what you propose or hypothesize based on prior literature and prior studies are the main constructs that will affect the implementation process and implementation outcome. Here it also includes the field of origin the number of times cited and the particular rating among those who have used the theory model or framework in the past. The ADAPT section gives some guidance for how to adapt if needed theories, models, and frameworks, and what are some of the benefits and why it might be necessary and what should be considered when adapting those theories, models, and frameworks. And some folks on one hand, believe that theories, models, and frameworks should not be adapted and should not be changed. And other folks, on the other hand, think that they should be adapted and modeled and modified to fit the particular context. Whichever aspect that you choose, although adapting a theory, model, and framework to your particular study may be recommended, in a grant application, one should be specific about how and why such adaptations were selected for this study and why they were necessary. The integrate aspect gives some suggestions for how to embed the theory model or framework and use it in your study planning and design. Again, woven throughout the grant application or your research study proposal from informing your hypotheses through selecting your implementation outcomes and perhaps patient or individual health outcomes as well. And measuring constructs, so you'll note again that in that list of dissemination and implementation theories, models, and frameworks, there are some constructs listed that are associated with that theory, model, and framework and what is used. So here we have a list of the constructs that are used, a definition that's offered, the number of models that that construct is being used in, and some examples of measures that can be used for assessing that particular construct, including the GEM DNI link for resources on measures, which we will also provide in the resources section. So in sum, 
Theories, models, and frameworks are critical for understanding and changing implementation processes and outcomes. They're really helpful for providing guidance to understanding context, which is one of the aspects of implementation research that is critical for understanding how and why particular aspects or factors may facilitate or impede the process and try to expedite that process as well. Again, it can and should be woven into your research proposal or grant application, and it's certainly an area, um, a hot topic for future research in terms of identifying what constructs may be more or less important for a particular context or particular evidence-based practices and programs. In trying to identify and model in structural equation modeling or causal modeling, how those factors interact on multiple levels to affect implementation processes and implementation outcomes. So while there are over 60 different models, theories, and frameworks, we certainly encourage you to think about if there are other theories, models, and frameworks from your scientific background that may be applicable that may add some benefit to those already in existence or propose new theories, models, and frameworks specifically that focus on trying to understand the causal effect of implementation constructs, barriers and facilitators on the implementation process and implementation outcomes. Please let me know if you have any additional questions or comments. My contact information is listed there. Thank you very much.